Not too long ago, Orlando was home to one of the most breathtaking, story-driven, and original theme park lands ever created. But this land did not exist within a Disney park. It existed just down the road at the Universal Orlando Resort. The story of the land is full of twists and mystery, as we discover that this land was originally designed, and then years later indirectly destroyed, by Disney. This is the story of the Lost Continent, an opening day land at the spectacular Islands of Adventure theme park. For a review time, I'm Luke Carroll, and let's explore the Disney land that Universal built. In order to see how Universal created this land, we need to take a look at how Disney was going to. It's a 1990s at Disney. Eisner is at the helm and the general public's opinion is turning sour towards a recent industry trend of movie studio theme parks. Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom required immersion and detail, and audiences desperately wanted new parks to bring back this immersion rather than the scaffolds, supports, and shelled facades that have become prominent in new parks such as Disney's Hollywood Studios. Disney World's upcoming fourth theme park had to completely remove this notion of tacky and cheap, and Disney wanted to get it right. Disney World's fourth gate was to be big budget, ambitious, and truly alive. A complete reinvention of what a theme park could be, the exact opposite of the mass-produced studio park era that came before it. This park was to be Animal Kingdom. Headed by the spectacular Joe Road, and of all of the planned lands, the one that oozed this ambition of immersion was Beastly Kingdom. Beastly Kingdom was to be home to all of the mythical creatures of fantasy and fairy tale. The land was to be split into two worlds, ruled by either good or evil. To the right of the land, a winding pathway would have led guests into a marble oasis, including a family water dark ride themed to Fantasia, as well as the groundbreaking walkthrough attraction, Quest for the Unicorn. If guests walked to the left of the land, however, they would enter a scorched battlefield, with a castle towering overhead, home to the entire park's anchor attraction, Dragon Tower. A combination of dark ride and roller coaster through the heart of a castle, ending in a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the fire-breathing dragon himself. Beastly Kingdom was poised to be the next evolution in Disney's storytelling. This was to open years before Tokyo Disney Sea would earn itself this title. This land was to be the perfect mix of the photorealistic areas of Animal Kingdom's Africa and Asia-themed lands, mixed with the fantastical elements Disney is known for. A true home for fanciful creatures and incredible adventures. Beastly Kingdom would have doubled Animal Kingdom's opening day attraction lineup and been an emotional, moving, and legendary land. And then suddenly, it was cancelled. Animal Kingdom was meant to be a brave return to form for Eisner, who had essentially stopped developing any large-scale projects after the complete failure that was Disneyland Paris's opening. But with ballooning costs for the zoological amenities of the park, the already nervous Eisner began to rethink the park's grand scale, and ultimately decided to go ahead with Dinoland USA over Beastly Kingdom. Due to the merchandising potential of dinosaurs, and the cost-saving measures of Countdown to Extinction using the already designed Indiana Jones ride system and track. So Dino Land would open with the park, and the area still earmarked for Beastly Kingdom was temporarily turned into the placeholding Camp Mini Mickey, with Beastly Kingdom delayed for a phase two of the park. However, this was the breaking point for a lot of Imagineers, who decided it might be time to start looking for other employers. The 1990s must have been a frustrating time for those working in Imagineering. The failure of Euro Disneyland and the cancellation of other projects in planning that came about because of it were felt all across the parks division. And for a lot of Imagineers, the cancellation of Beastly Kingdom was the final straw. After years of downsized and abandoned projects thanks to Eisner's penny pinching, Imagineers took their designs and headed out to find a company willing to bring their hard work to life. Their search would find a lot of them a home not too far down the road from Animal Kingdom, at the upcoming second gate for the Universal Orlando Resort, who greeted Disney's scorned Imagineers with a simple, build it here instead. Islands of Adventure was to be as much of a redesigning of what a theme park could be as Animal Kingdom was. This park was to do away with the studio theme park Universal had always been known for, 
and would aim to meet, match, and in areas exceed Disney's standards of creating immersively themed lands for their guests. Visitors wouldn't just see how movies were made, but they would step into the movies, exploring well-known stories as well as creating their own. The park would open with six lands. Zeus Landing, themed to the Dr. Zeus stories of books, Marvel Superhero Island, featuring your favourite Marvel comic characters, Toon Lagoon, based on the King's comics, and of course Jurassic Park, based on the Steven Spielberg blockbusters. The sixth and final land, however, was to be completely different. It wasn't to be based directly upon any household franchise, but instead upon timeless myths and legends. This land was the Lost Continent, and many of the grandiose ideas cancelled with Beastly Kingdom would finally be realised here. Upon opening, the land was split into three distinct areas of legend. If you entered the land from the cartoony world of Zeus, you would first reach the starkly contrasting Lost City, the most mystical of the Lost Continent's three realms, dedicated to the ancient Greek gods of old. The first thing you would stumble upon after entering the land is an impressive sandstone mountain range, which seems to come alive through anciently carved faces with waterfalls pouring from their mouths. Inside this mountain range is Mythos, one of the most awarded theme park restaurants in history. But the grandeur of Mythos was nothing compared to the Lost City's icon, the Temple of Poseidon, which is still to this day one of the most staggeringly impressive structures built in a theme park. Dragging you into the temple is an 80-foot high trident gripped in the stone hand of a fallen statue, pointing you towards the land's icon attraction, Poseidon's Fury. A walkthrough experience with some truly spectacular effects that deservedly allowed islands of adventure to be billed as the world's most technologically advanced theme park at its opening. Moving around from the lost city, you would enter Sinbad's Bazaar, themed to the Middle Eastern legends of Sinbad from 1001 Nights. The area is home to an Arabian marketplace filled with artisans and grilled meats, as well as the park's stunt show, The Eighth Voyage of Sinbad. The show featured an adaptation of the Sinbad story, where he tried to rescue the princess from the evil witch, Miseria. Unfortunately, as the spectacular stage was designed before a script was even in mind, the show as a whole would ultimately prove to be forgettable. What wasn't forgettable, however, stood just outside the show. The mystic fountain was an all-knowing oracle, who happened to be trapped inside a fountain. Guests could interact and chat directly with him in real time. Just be careful you don't get on his bad side, though, as dozens of hidden water spray nozzles could attack you at any time. The third and final subland was Merlinwood, where tales of sorcery, magic and mystery awaited guests. Stepping into the village, visitors would feel as if they had stepped directly into the tales of King Arthur, with its cobblestone streets, thatched roof huts, and the impressive enchanted oak tavern, whereby stepping into a giant oak tree, which bears a face similar to that of Merlin himself, you could indulge in grilled and smoked meats, as well as traditional pub fare. Just outside the village, in a forested corner, was the Flying Unicorn, which was a standard family coaster which was quickly added only a year after the park's opening, due to guest complaints of the park not having enough family-friendly rides. For thrill-seekers, however, Merlinwood housed one of the most memorable coaster experiences of all time. Entering past the impressive 50-foot-high carvings of battle-worn dragons, you would step foot into the immersive and detailed queue of dueling dragons. Two interwoven B&M inverted coasters who seemed to duel each other as the trains raced around the track, emulating the experience of two dragons fighting in mid-air. In order to experience what this fight was like, you would enter a foreboding castle, which housed a lengthy, intricate queue touring the castle's dilapidated remains. Until you got to the spellbook of Merlin himself, which gave you the ultimate decision to make. Would you like to ride on the ice, or Fire Dragon. Whilst each track featured different elements, speeds and features throughout, a patented computer system would ensure the trains would attack each other at three key points along the track layout that would put the dragons within 18 inches of each other. The sheer brilliance of the Lost Continent was that it didn't just tell one story, but successfully integrated three stories into one of, if not the most jaw-dropping themed land in all of Florida at the time. 
The plans for a dragon roller coaster that began in a crumbling castle was all too familiar for people knowledgeable about the beastly kingdom plans. Imagineers had brought their grandiose ideas of dragons and unicorns that Disney didn't want to know about and brought them to life at Universal, all whilst also adding equally exciting stories of the Middle East and a lost waterlogged city. Even though the Lost Continent was a glittering gem in the lineup of Islands of Adventure, it wouldn't even survive for 10 years after the park opening. And as it was Disney that indirectly led to the creation of the land, it was also Disney that indirectly led to its destruction. In the mid-2000s, Disney was determined on securing the global theme park rights to the Harry Potter franchise, and negotiations were quite far along until Rowling made demands that Disney refused to sign on to. Disney and Rowling parted ways, and Rowling wouldn't have to look too far to find another company willing to bring the boy who lived to life. The original plans to implement Harry Potter at Universal Studios Orlando was a relatively simple overlay of the Lost Continent's Merlinwood section, keeping the Enchanted Oak Tavern and Dueling Dragons, and just implementing new theming, roving characters, and merchandise. With the major Harry Potter addition to the land being a cutting-edge e-ticket ride that would allow Hogwarts Castle to rise over Merlinwood. But this wasn't enough for Rowling. She wanted the land to be so much more than just a simple overlay. And so on the 31st of May 2007, it was announced that the Wizarding World of Harry Potter would become an entirely new seventh land at Islands of Adventure, completely overtaking the Merlinwood section of the Lost Continent. A bridge was built between Jurassic Park and Sinbad's Bazaar as Merlin Wood got absorbed by construction walls, never to be seen again. A few years later, in June of 2010, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter opened in Merlin Wood's place, changing the theme park industry forever, taking the art of theming and immersion to an even higher level than what Merlin Wood had achieved. Entering the land, it truly feels as if you had stepped foot into Hogsmeade and were able to explore Hogwarts in the groundbreaking Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey attraction. To round out the ride count in the land, the Flying Unicorn would be rethemed to Flight of the Hippogriff, and Dueling Dragons would be rethemed to Dragon Challenge. Though many fans were quick to admit that the bare, unthemed metal of the coaster was a major detraction in a land so committed to immersion. Whilst it was rumored the remaining areas of the Lost Continent would soon be absorbed into the Wizarding World, the land mostly limped on, seeing very little changes to today. The two major changes over the last nine years include the removal of dueling dragons, which had to stop dueling years earlier, to be replaced by the more thematically appropriate and amazing looking Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure. Also, after almost 20 years of shows, the eighth voyage of Sinbad's stunt show would see its final bow on September 15, 2018 with the theatre currently still standing, but not operating. Today, you can luckily still experience the great effects of Poseidon's Fury and the spectacular dining offered by Mythos. But unfortunately, most of the magic of the Lost Continent has today been lost and replaced by the magic of a boy wizard. Rumours continually fly around about the land being overtaken by the next Harry Potter expansion or even a Legend of Zelda-themed area, but somehow the Lost Continent keeps hanging on still allowing us to experience what Disney Imagineers could do when given the chance to design a land for Universal Studios. So for those of you keeping tabs, Disney canned Beastly Kingdom, which made Imagineers hop to Universal, who then adapted it into the Lost Continent. Then Disney canned Harry Potter, which also went over to Universal, which overtook part of the Lost Continent. In response, Disney bought the rights to Avatar, which took over the land that was originally earmarked for Beastly Kingdom. So, who knows? If Disney hadn't have cancelled Beastly Kingdom, we may never have had the Lost Continent, Pandora the World of Avatar, or the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And that, my friends, is a strangely intertwined story, if I've ever heard one. For review time, I'm Luke Carroll. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing.